are in listen only mode. Hello everyone. Welcome to the webcast. My name is Christine Dursey Davis. I'm the executive director of the Ohio chapter of APA and chair of the New Urbanism Division and I am your webcast moderator. Today is Friday, May 6th and we will hear the presentation What I Wish I Knew. For technical help during today's webcast, you can type your questions in the chat box found in the webcast toolbar to the right of your screen, or you can call the 1-800 number shown in bold. And for your content questions related to the presentation, you can type those in the questions box that's also located in uh, the webinar toolbar to the right of your screen. And we will answer those at the end of the presentation during the Q&A. And I'll ask uh, that when you're typing in your question that you also include who you would like to answer the question. Coming up on your screen is a list of the sponsoring chapters and divisions for 2016. Thanks to all the participating sponsors for making these webcasts possible and free to their members. In particular, today's webcast is sponsored by the Private Practice Division, which we'll hear a little bit more about in a moment. Um, and to learn more about the Private Practice Division, uh, visit planning.org slash division slash private practice. To learn about divisions, planning.org slash divisions. And to chapters, planning.org slash chapters. Coming up on your screen is a list of our upcoming webcasts. You can register for these by visiting our webcast webpage, which is ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. And to log your CM credits for attending today's webcast, just head over to planning.org and log in your My APA account. And then you can um, select search for CM activities. And in that search bar, you can type either the event number or the title of today's webcast, and it'll pop up for you. And if you uh, need the event number or the title again, you can find both of them on our webcast webpage, ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcast. And this webcast has been approved for one and a half CM credits for live viewing only. Uh, we do have some recorded webcasts that are available for distance education. And you can learn more about that, uh, again, on our webcast webpage at ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcast. For sure, we have one ethics session available for distance education and one law session. So for those that need to get their sessions or their uh, CM credits in by the end of the month, this is for you. Next, like us on Facebook, Planning Webcast Series, to receive up-to-date information on our sessions. And we are recording today's webcast, and it will be available on our YouTube channel. Just head over to YouTube and type in Planning Webcast, and that'll pop up. And we'll also have a PDF of the presentation available after uh, the end of the session, again, at our webcast webpage, ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcast. All right, I'm going to turn it over now to Dina Roadside with the Private Practice Division, who's going to kick off today's session. Dina. Thank you so much, Christine. Uh, welcome to the What I Wish I Knew discussion. Uh, this was presented this year at the uh, APA conference. Uh, we had oh somewhere around 200 people, I think, in the room to uh, think about and talk about the differences between uh, what it's like to work in the private sector and the public sector um, to explore a variety of issues uh, related to uh, biases about the various sectors and what experience, personal experiences have been in those sectors. And we're delighted to be able to um, repeat this uh, session for all of you. Uh, today we have people who uh, on the panel who have had extensive experience in both public and private sectors. And you know, we use public and private sector loosely here. Uh, of course, they're very 
different and they all have different grades of experience. So private can be an office of one person or five people and it can be an office of 500 people. And the experiences, of course, will be very different in those. Similarly, for the public sector, you could be working in a lo small local agency or you could be working on the other end of the spectrum uh, for a federal agency or a regional agency, state agency. But the people we have uh, speaking today have a variety of experiences in both sectors, uh, beginning with Ralph uh, Wilmer, who has gone from the private sector, smaller law firm experience to a larger regional public sector experience. Jennifer Corey, who has gone, gone from public sector to um, owning her own firm and having a private sector uh, career now. And then Todd Ashby and Michael Jellin, uh, who have uh, had experience, multiple experiences in both sectors, and uh, can share those with you as well. The uh, as Christine has said, the session today is being sponsored by the Private Practice Division. Our division. Um, presents a venue for those in private practice to network uh, and communicate and to learn from others who are also in private practice to share information and to have access to resources uh, relevant to private practice uh, practitioners. The uh, private practice division has produced a wonderful uh, handbook about all aspects of private practice from running a business to business development um, to policies, et cetera. And um, we are very pleased to offer this publication to all members of the private practice division and to learn more about it. The, there is a, um, what's the website on the bottom of this screen. With that, I wanted to turn this session over to uh, Ralph Wilmer to talk a bit about um, his experience. Each of the presenters will tell you a little bit about their career bio, what they've learned from their experiences, and also what lessons they've learned that they can share with others. So with that, Ralph, I will switch this to you. OK, thank you. Um, so uh, my name is Ralph Wilmer, and uh, I've been a planner for a good number of years, dating back to sometime last century. And as Dina mentioned uh, at the beginning, um, my career has taken a pretty uh, varied path. And um, so just by way of introduction, uh, my uh, undergraduate degree is actually from a forestry school. Um, my bachelor's is in environmental and resources management. My master's is from Tufts University's urban and environmental policy program. But uh, it was not an accredited planning school at the time, so I didn't really um, get too in, uh, I didn't get too much of an introduction to planning at that particular time. Um, although I did take a couple of classes. Um, and then I started off in the nonprofit advocacy uh, sector, working for the Public Interest Research Group, which was a spin-off of some of Ralph Nader's organizations. But my planning career, my environmental career, really started with McGregor & Associates, which is a private sector law firm. It was uh, what they call a boutique law firm, um, really just specialized in environmental and land use uh, law. And it was a small firm. As, as Dina uh, indicated. Uh, we were, during my time there, uh, about 8 to 15 people. Uh, it varied over the years. But while I was in grad school, uh, Mr. McGregor uh, was my environmental law professor. And uh, he taught my class. And I guess I did well enough to have him invite me to um, work with him as an intern. And then while he was writing letters of recommendation for me, we started to talk about whether or not it made sense for a non-lawyer to work in a law firm. It clearly was not the path that I had envisioned or scripted when I was 
uh, in grad school, but I figured I'd give it a whirl because he was offering me a job. And um, I wound up doing a lot of work relating to some of the clients that we had, just providing support services, and uh, essentially my billing rate was a lot less than those of the attorneys, and I was able to provide uh, some expertise that uh, the attorneys may not have necessarily been trained to provide. Uh, again, since we were only doing environmental and land use law, I was helping with permitting and environmental impact review and things along those lines. And uh, at the end of the day, I guess this worked out better than I expected because I was there for more than uh, 20 years. Um, then I was given an opportunity to work in a different kind of uh, environment and uh, responded to a job opening for a senior planner, someone with more than 15 years of, of experience. And I wound up working for Vanessa Hang and Breslin. Um, by the way, I'm based in the Boston area. Um, and that's where the headquarters office was for VHB. And that was a private sector multidisciplinary engineering firm. So. This was a, all of a sudden I was uh, jumping to a company that was about 100 times larger than, uh, than where I had worked before. Um, but I worked within the planning division there and uh, it was relatively small. Um, so I don't think that I really felt the impacts of being in a large organization uh, directly um, as much. And then after 10 years there, I wound up uh, chasing an opportunity to uh, go into the public sector. Uh, I wanted to do something different and essentially I wanted to uh, work for an organization that was uh, populated and dominated by planners, people who walked, talked, and thought like I did. And um, I am a principal planner at the Metropolitan Area Planning Council which serves Boston and 101 cities and towns in the greater Boston area. So uh, very different experience and uh, um, I'll just go over uh, a few things, like things that I wish I had known. Um, when I started off uh, with the law firm, I was essentially doing just, as I had mentioned, uh, more uh, legal support or uh, technical support for the lawyers on a variety of uh, projects and cases. Um, somewhere along the line, I started seeing requests for proposals to do planning work, and I started responding to them, and slowly but surely won some, and I was able to create my own planning practice within, uh, within the law firm. So um, I continued to do that. My practice was entirely uh, public sector planning, so I worked mostly for municipalities. But what I found was that every time I had to um, uh, chase a project, I had to pull together a team with, with other firms. But um, while I had expectations for how many billable hours I was supposed to put in versus time spent for admin or business development, it wasn't a hard and rigorous standard. As long as I was doing my job, uh, the, the uh, principals, the um, partners of the law firm were rel relatively happy. When I moved to VHB, that expectation was notched up a little bit. Um, and at times I found, because it was an engineering-based firm, that the utilization and billability expectations were uh, not, um, they didn't correlate well with the amount of time I needed to spend in a planning practice to do the business development because we have to review the proposals, we have to prepare the proposals, we have to prepare for the interviews and do all the contract and admin work associated with it. Um, so what I found at uh, VHB was that um, there were some fairly rigid utilization and billability expectations. And while I think it worked well for the engineering part or discipline of the firm, I don't think it worked as well for, for the planners. And when I discussed this with planning colleagues of mine, particularly ones that worked in uh, planning firms or design firms, either they didn't have billability targets or um, they were uh, much more uh, relaxed and uh, um, the target was much lower so that you could spend the amount of time working on uh, the business development and admin part of it. 
So um, the next bullet point is marketing and business development. That's a huge expectation when you're in the private sector, and I know my colleagues on the uh, panel will talk about this as well. But as I mentioned, it is a very big time commitment, and what I found is that I had to do uh, a lot of that work during the evenings and um, and over the weekends when there were proposals due and, and things along those lines. Um, in terms of ad internal administrative processes, that's one thing that I'm finding is uh, uh, a little bit more of a significant hurdle at the uh, public sector agency. Um, you know, processes that have been in place for years and years and years seem to uh, continue and. Uh, um, you know, I was used to doing certain things in the private sector that I didn't have to worry about, and I would just go and do them and didn't have to seek permission and, and things along those lines. But uh, here at MAPC, I find that that is uh, there is more of a process, and I've had to been uh, I had to be reminded of that a couple of times. But um, after about a year on this particular job, I'm starting to get used to it. Um, in terms of some issues to consider, uh, there are. Uh, um, ethical considerations. Obviously, they were always in place, particularly from an AICP point of view. And obviously, because I was working mostly for public sector clients. But um, at MAPC, um, you are a public agency. You have to provide public records. A lot of the work that you do is in the public sector. And you have to make the records available if, if requested. So that's just something that you have to keep in mind. Um, as you're going forward uh, in, in the public sector. And again, not to minimize it in the private sector, but you weren't necessarily um, the keeper of the records and, and things along those lines. So um, if you're interested in making a switch, uh, just keep in mind that all organizations are different regardless of whether you're moving from the private sector to the public sector or vice versa, whether you're moving from a, a company that's maybe 10 people to one that's about 1,000 people. Um, in each job, you're going to have new systems, new people to work with, uh, new uh, supervisors with different personalities. The office culture is going to be uh, much more different. And what I found here at MAPC is that it is a much more collaborative organization in terms of its culture. Uh, I think we work very, very well together here. And it was just part of the culture when I when I got here, and uh, it was a refreshing change for me. Because sometimes in the private sector, we always had to check to see whether there was a conflict. There may have been a great project that we were interested in pursuing, but because uh, companies like VHB work both the private and public sector in terms of its clients, um, there were jobs that I would have liked to have um, uh, pursued when I was uh, at BHB, but uh, because of conflict review, and obviously that's an important thing to consider too, but it prevented us from uh, uh, going after um, some projects, either because there was uh, already a project that created a conflict, or because there was an interest in pursuing work. And even though the work wasn't in, um, the private sector work usually results in much larger contracts than the public sector work. Um, questions always come up about, you know, what is the difference between private and public sector? Do you expect a similar workload and, and things along those lines? And, you know, if you're a planner, uh, long hours, evening meetings, it's an occupational hazard. So um, from my perspective, you can expect a similar workload, similar um, time spent uh, maybe after hours, uh, making sure that you got everything done, meeting your deadlines, and there will be evening meetings. Um, don't assume that job security is more assured in one sector or the other. Um, I've seen friends who've been laid off from uh, public sector jobs because of change in political administration or things along those lines, phasing out of projects or um, programs, things along those lines. Um, and uh, the reason that I left DHB was because I was laid off. So um, the private sector doesn't necessarily hold uh, greater job security. There's a lot of different factors that go into um, how you uh, manage to keep your job over the years. And then uh, finally, thinking about professional development and support for outside activities, whether it's APA, um, in the community, et cetera, um, 
I've been happy that all of the organizations that I've worked for have, have supported my APA activities uh, over the years. I was involved with uh, various uh, levels of leadership at APA uh, for a good number of years, and that has always been uh, supported by my, uh, by my employers. And professional development is an important part of your uh, personal growth in terms of uh, uh, your job. So um, that concludes what I would have to say, and I'm going to turn it over to uh, Jen. Good morning. How are you today? Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. I'm honored to have this opportunity and chance to speak to you today. Um, we have a couple of different planners here. My focus is a little bit different. I am a sole practitioner. I own and I operate my own planning practice. Uh, it's myself, my assistant, and one other uh, planner that works for me. Um, a little bit about my company is I do property due diligence work, which means I do zoning, variances, um, and entitlement work. I don't do any land use planning. I don't do anything um, with general plans or anything like that. Um, and finally, the last thing I do, which is probably a big component of it is, is the project and prevent management. In other words, watching a project as it progresses along the development timeline and making sure that it's able to get permits correctly and to problem solve and resolve any issues that happen at the cities or at the counties. Uh, before going out on my own, I did work for a law firm um, that practiced language law called Gamage and Burnham. I was there for 10 years. And um, before that, I played mom to a couple of kids. And then before that, I got my start out at the public sector at the city of Peoria in Arizona. Um, so I've been all over the place. And it's funny how your career kind of progresses and changes as your life progresses. And you know that's what happens with a career sometimes. So the first switch I want to talk about is my most recent one, which is where I moved from the public sector, um, excuse me, the first one, which is where I moved from the public sector, which is the city of Peoria, to the law firm. And this was a big deal. Um, I was used to working for a city where People would come in, applicants would come in, and I was the person who was making the decision. So my clients ended up being the applicants. Um, my job at the time required you know, writing staff reports, doing analysis, making presentations to the council, planning commission, and board of adjustments. Um, so we're used to a style of writing that's very different. It's a, it's a very legislative type of writing, very dry, non-descriptive. Um, much more of an analytical type of style of writing. So when I moved to the law firm, the one thing I found out was that the style of writing is completely different. It's a very persuasive type of writing. You're essentially putting together a sales presentation. Um, so that took me by surprise is how different the writing style is. And I thought I was a good writer, but that was one of the first things I learned I had to relearn. Um, the other thing I learned was that the power dynamics change because when you're at the city, you're being lobbied by the applicants, but when you're at the law firm, all of a sudden it's your job to convince and to lobby the city officials to approve your project. Um, I learned a lot. I worked for some really smart people, um, and it was a great experience because you get a, tend to get a different perspective than planners. Um, their, pers their view of projects is just a little bit different than how the city officials learn. So for me, it was a good opportunity to understand, um, to kind of understand the other side of the coin, understand what private side people were actually thinking and what their um, perspective was. Um, so the one thing I want to emphasize is when you go to work for a law firm, it's a dead end project. If you're not an attorney, you're never going to become partner. So you're a planner and you're going to remain a planner. Um, your pay is very well, the hours are long. Um, and you're billing very differently. So when you're at the city, you don't have to worry about billing at all. But when you're working for a law firm, your life comes down to billing in six-minute increments. Um, and absolutely everything you do, you have to write down on timesheet so that you can bill the client for it. So it's very different, your um, 
the attention to the time you spend on projects becomes very focused. The last project, last move I made was actually moved from the law firm to starting my own firm in 2013. So I've been on my own for almost three years now. And making that jump was very scary. It was one of the riskiest things I had ever done. Um, at, the, at the law firm, I knew what I was doing. I had a great practice. Um, I had a lot of an autonomy of what I was doing. Um, but I was ready for the next step. And for me, I've been kind of contemplating for a while, and I ended up having a client who said, if you go on your own, I will give you your first project. And it was one of those things where I had to jump, and I had to jump really fast. And I actually had to quit my job at the law firm and give them one week's notice. Um, but So I was fortunate enough to start the firm out, and I was able to start out with one client. Um, but that was enough to get me to keep me afloat um, until I could build up my practice. Um, the first lesson I learned on being my own is just because you know how to do zoning doesn't know you know doesn't mean you know how to run a business. They are very different practice areas. Um, so I learned everything from scratch: how to invoice, how to do taxes, how to open a website, absolutely everything. I didn't know how to do anything. Um, my only experience with running a business was probably that accounting 101 class I took in college 20 years ago, and frankly, that didn't help a whole lot. So. It took a lot of effort to learn how to run a business. Um, the other thing, too, that keep in mind is administrative items, such as keeping track of your billing, your invoicing, et cetera, et cetera. It takes a lot of time, and that's something you can't bill clients for. So the more you spend on administrative time, that's less opportunities for you to actually bill clients and for you actually to make money. So it's, it's always a struggle learning how to balance your time between administrative tasks an actual billing class. Um, and there's that balance as well. And again, you as being on your own, you have to find your own clients. No one's giving them to you. So there's a lot of time you have to spend in in networking with clients, going out to those events where you're going to meet the people you need to, making those sales calls, um, anything you can do to get your name out there, and also in order to ask for the business. Um, being a sole practitioner, there is very high risk, but there's also great earnings potential. Um, and the risk really dictates the reason why there's, it's so lucrative is if, you, if you, you're billing in an hourly rate or by a project, you get to keep the entire pie, well, except for taxes, insurance, and all that stuff. But when you work for a law firm or you work for another private practice, pretty much most of everything that you bill goes to the house, and so you never see that. So there's a great earnings potential, but you need to balance it with you know, all the other administrative stuff and the, what it takes to run a business says that. Um, but in, in the most important part to think is if you don't work, you don't get paid. I mean, that equates to, you know, flexibility. Um, and it's great as far as family balance because you can control the hours that you work and when you work. But the core issue is if you don't work, you don't get paid. So you don't want to turn work, work away because you want to make sure your pipeline is, is full. But at the same time, um, you need to go and balance it and re be able to reorganize your schedule to work. And for me, that means I go in the office about 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning, and I work till about 2 o'clock in, in the afternoon, and then I'm able to go pick my kids up from school and play mob in the afternoon. I still have hearings that I have to do. Um, so for me, it tends to be that I go back to work, you know, at 6 or 7 o'clock at night so I can attend those hearings and do that. Um, another thing to keep in mind if you move from, when you move to be a sole practitioner is, retirement planning. There's no 401k, there's no retirement plan or pension. Um, so you have to make sure that a big part of what you do is you put money aside because, so you can have your own retirement planning. Um, advice for making a switch. There's a lot of things you can do, but if you're moving from the public sector to a law firm, I think my first recommendation, of course, is to take a writing class. And the class that I took was actually a law class. It's called Brian Gardner's Advanced Legal Writing. And it's been 15 years since I've taken that class, but I still have the book on my bookshelf, and I refer to it often. Um, the other thing you I learned is that law firms, lawyers are very quirky people, smart, very, very quirky. Uh, so you've got to definitely learn to understand those personalities. Um, and if you go into it knowing that you're going to learn a lot and there's and this is a learning opportunity, but your opportunity to grow as far as professionally is limited, you're going to be okay, but you need to understand that you're never 
going to be able to grow your career. It's a pretty much a lateral and a flat career making decision. A lot of people go into go to work for a law firm knowing that eventually they're going to make the step back to public sector or to their own business, and that's a good decision. Um, and the final recommendation I have on that thing is is the people at the cities and the counties are going to be your best friends because those are the ones that need to approve your project. So you can't burn projects. You need to be nice to them, and you need to make sure you do whatever you need to do in order to get the projects approved. Essentially, don't burn bridges. This is all about relationships. Um, making a jump from a law firm to sole practitioner, this is more along the lines of business development and how to run a business. Um, first of all, before you jump, you need to do some um, planning. So you need to understand what your business plan is. In other words, you got to make those decisions. You need to understand what's the minimum amount of hours you need to bill. How are you going to get um, those clients and how are you going to keep that pipeline filled so you do have business coming in the door. Um, and you need to do that before you make the jump because you need to understand whether or not it's actually feasible for you to in jump. Um, logistical issues. Where is your office going to be at? Are you going to work at home? Are you going to go to a co-working opportunity place? Or are you going to go out and uh, rent office space and run a traditional business? Um, the, do you not even know how to run a business? Do you know how to do invoicing? Do you know how to do billing? Um, anything like that. For me, I found QuickBooks to be my source for my for my bookkeeping, and I use a software program called Harvest to log my hours and to do my invoicing. Um, another consideration is you need to have professional malpractice insurance. Uh, this is one thing I had no idea and didn't even think about when I started my own firm, but it's expensive. Um, but you have to have it. You need to have that liability insurance in case something happens. Uh, so make sure you get an estimate on that because that can, that will run you several thousand dollars a year depending upon what you're going to be billing. Um, finally, the other thing you have to think about is your contract with your clients, your engagement letter. You need to make sure you have a good engagement letter that clearly defines the scope of your services. Um, and it's something that also goes and limits your liability. In other words, if you screw up on a $10,000 job, you don't want that company to come back and sue you for $2 million. So you need to make sure your engagement letter is correct. Um, that you have those disclosures and those terms that protect you in the long run. Um, have an attorney review it and also a lot of times whoever holds your professional malpractice insurance, they'll also look at it and give you their input. Um, finally, go and make friends with people who are other self-employed like you and have them become a mentor. You need to have someone that you can ask those really stupid business questions to. How do I do this? Where do you find this? Or what did you do here? Um, and then make sure, you also have to get email, website services, and for that I use GoDaddy. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, it all comes down to networking, networking, networking. And finally, my last piece of advice is Private Practice Division's got a handbook called Private Practitioner. If you're a member of the division, the handbook is free, and it ended up being a really good resource for me to answer a lot of these silly questions that I had about how to open a business and the ethics of it and getting the contract and what to do there. Um, so I definitely encourage you to become a member if for no other reason just so you can get your hand on that handbook. So uh, with that I'm going to switch it over to Mike. Bear with me guys, sorry. Uh, actually um, uh -huh. I think you, you should switch it to Todd next. I'm sorry. Sorry about that. Let me try that again. Actually, I think Michael, you're, there it is. Okay. Perfect. Well, good afternoon and, or good morning, depending on uh, your, your location. Hopefully, you can all see that now. Um, my name is Todd Ashby. I'm the executive director at the Des Moines Area MPO. Um, I started uh, uh, school and uh, got a community and regional planning degree uh, back in the early 90s, uh, then a public administration master's degree. Um, I w went to work for the Missouri DOT out of, out of college, and um, that was just when ICT, one of the, the highway legislation that was passed in the early 90s, 92, uh, had taken effect, and it incorporated a lot more planning activities into traditional highway planning. And so I was the, the token planner that the Missouri DOT hired. And uh, it was an interesting um, experience dealing with uh, engineers, 
uh, kind of taking their first look at a lot of planning issues and, and having someone uh, without an engineering background uh, being involved in, in their domain. Um, we uh, both learned a lot in that process and it was a, a great experience. I had a, a very good uh, a boss who was uh, open to a lot of different ideas and a, a good experience all around. I later went on to the Mid-America Regional Council, the MPO, and, and uh, COG in Kansas City and uh, focused on transportation there and then made the jump uh, to CH2M Hill, uh, was uh, recruited to go to, to that sector. They were uh, doing more transportation work in Iowa in particular and uh, asked me to, to join them. Uh, moved to a couple different uh, engineering firms doing similar things on transportation and planning, some aviation, and uh, then later uh, took this, this position about five years ago. Um, much like the others, um, there's little uh, different approaches to business depending on whether you're on the public or private side. Um, from the, the, the MPO or the DOT, uh, all the uh, public entities are, are your clients. You're working with the cities, the counties um, to, to develop uh, what are the transportation plans or projects. Or on the, the private side, um, you're focused just on one client or, or uh, one particular project for a client. You're not looking at a lot of the, the overall picture on, on certain things, uh, typically. So the project focus is different on, on those, depending on which side of the fence you're on. As Jennifer uh, discussed, the billable hours is always uh, something you got to be watchful of. There's the administration side that you can't charge for. Um, there's also expectations. From the firm, if you're with a firm, um, what your billable rate is, what your ratio of hours are. So uh, know what that is going into it and what, what the expectation is. Are you expected to bill 90% of the time, 80% of the time? Because um, if you're at those high ratios, your ability to go after work is, is fairly limited. So just know, know what you're walking into at the beginning. As others have said, um, uh, the workload is very similar. Uh, uh, just, uh, just a little different focus. And then the public pri process is a lot different than sometimes on the private side. The public process tends to take a little longer. You've got more requirements for meetings, uh, public records, those type of things. Um, when you're working with consultants, um, the, the expectation is you turn it around and quickly get on to the next job um, while making sure you take care of everything, but just the timelines are, are much different, I think. Um, some of the expectations of, of changing sides uh, kind of alluded to this, but the systems are just different or the processes are different. Um, on the public side, you've got much more of, of the documentation, making sure you're, you're doing all the public requirements, the open records things, uh, just the kind of the bureaucratic nature of, of local governments or state governments, uh, how they work. On the private side, it's a little different. As I mentioned, the workload's very uh, similar, um, just the intensity may vary at times. I think um, Michael mentioned this, but professional development, I think, is a key uh, to um, stay current, know what's going on in the world, uh, and also just in those, when you're doing those uh, professional development uh, things, you, you don't know where that may lead to a different opportunity, whether that's a job or a different uh, uh, career move. Um, a lot of times people think on salary that um, on the private side the salary is much higher and in times it is but some of those other benefits um, may not be the same. Um, you may not have the same health insurance or the same time off or, or those things so just make sure you're weighing all those options together um, as a whole not just look at, at, at the salary number which sometimes can be, be different. And then um, I think the most important thing is do the things you like to do. Um, don't always just chase the, the next career move to, to think you have to go after that next advancement if you're really enjoying what you're doing. Look at that way so that you can improve that situation um, rather than just chase, like I, like I was mentioning earlier, just chasing the, the higher dollar amount. That may not be the right move at that time. Um, and with that, I turn it over to Ralph. I can figure out how.
Ralph, are you having trouble? And you're also muted, just in case you didn't know. It's actually supposed to go to Michael. Oh, okay. Oh, you're right. Okay, hold on. I think I have it now. So uh, one of the advantages of going last is that I get to hear what everybody else said before. And uh, when we were in Phoenix, um, I said what I wish I'd known, that we were all kind of on the same page. And uh, I had the advantage now going into it of, of recalling what all my colleagues had said. And, and we continue to be largely saying a lot of the same things. Uh, and what I'm going to try to do is not repeat, but uh, say reinforce and say some some other things that haven't been said already. Um, I also want to apologize to everybody in advance. I wish I'd known, sitting in our office in Washington, D.C., and I'd wish I'd known that there was going to be so much emergency activity today. Several ambulances have gone by already just since uh, we've started, and one might come by, uh, and I apologize in advance for the disruption. So um, presently, I work for AECOM. Uh, this, uh, list of my experience goes from the oldest. I worked at the University of Illinois back in the 80s. I work at AECOM presently. I'm a vice president and uh, business unit leader for our transportation practice in the DC metropolitan region. Uh, our practice here, we have a little over 100 people, um, planners, environmental planners, traffic engineers, uh, travel demand modelers, economists, uh, engineers and construction managers, and we'll do everything from long-range strategic planning for transportation agencies through environmental planning and project development, as well as uh, technical feasibility studies, final design, and construction management services. Uh, somebody told me a, a while ago that you need to hear something on average 10 or 11 times to, to commit it to memory. And there are a couple of key takeaways that I have from my colleagues that spoke that I want to make sure uh, that get out there. So I'm going to skip around between my slides a little bit. I'll come back to this in a sec. Um, when I get back to the slide on my experience, I want to talk uh, a little bit about some of the things that I wish I'd known at different levels. Um, and later on, I'm going to elaborate on this. but. Some of the key differences between the public sector and the private sector that I think are a key takeaway for me is that when you're in the public sector, public sector are decision makers. They, public sector um, employees and leaders actually make decisions that affect uh, the cities and states that we live in. Um, the private sector, if you're a planner in the private sector, you're, you're not a decision maker. You're, you're providing detailed advice, um, facts and figures and recommendations to decision makers, but not actually making decisions. Okay, And I think that um, sometimes uh, making the switch from public sector to private sector and back, that transition from being a decision maker or close, close to a decision maker with a, with a decision making agency to the, to the side that really just supports that uh, can be a challenge for a lot of people. Now, on my last slide, I'm going to talk some more about the advice. Um, the key takeaway that I want to highlight up front is that for everybody who's concerned about staying in the profession and, and uh, maintaining their career, you, you really need to know what is within your control and focus on that. And what is within all of our controls are our relationships with our peers, our body of work, the projects that we work on and the quality of it, uh, as well as our volunteer activities such as uh, volunteerism with APA and other professional organizations and uh, charities in, in our community. And if you focus on those things and, and deliver well uh, and, and maintain good relationships, you, you don't have to worry about being employed. You will always, you will always be employed. Okay, so uh, back to me. I, I did study civil engineering. I went to the University of Illinois back in the 80s. Um, 
my family was not uh, of means, so I was in the ROTC as well as I worked full time. Uh, actually, I had two jobs, uh, but uh, the one that took up most of my time was working with the University of Illinois Computer Services offices. And uh, after uh, college, I went to work at the Illinois Department of Transportation. I have to say, you know, when I was in college, uh, for those of you who might be students that are out there, um, especially if, if you're like me and don't come from a professional family or a community of professionals, um, college and my college work experience really did not necessarily uh, prepare me well for the professional environment. It's very, very, very different working as a professional than it is working as in non-professional labor. Uh, and I want you to keep that in mind. Um, I, I don't know uh, if I would have made a different choice if I had had a better uh, uh, education in that regard. Um, in hindsight, I think the first job that I took was a fine one. Uh, I went to the Illinois Department of Transportation after interviewing with a number of places because the Illinois DOT offered a three-year uh, career training program um, in which you, everybody in the program spent a year working in construction, a year working in design, and a year working as a planner. And then after the planning experience, you would graduate and have a choice uh, where else to go in the department. And I think that the Illinois DOT had, had that right back then, and it's still right today. Um, getting your boots on the ground and getting involved in construction, uh, which is at the end of the day, at the, at the end of the long relay race of project development that starts with planning, um, really informs how things happen out in, in the field and challenges that constructors have to deal with because of poor design, and, and also because of maybe improper planning. Then uh, working as a designer a little bit, um, you do a better job knowing the challenges that the folks in construction have to deal with. Um, the last year as a planner, then you have that experience of having been in the field and built some things, having been in a designer and having had to detail, uh, uh, take to the next level um, work that planners had done. And, and knowing what those designers need, what those constructors need in an end product from a planning process to do their jobs well. And I, and I, I would encourage anybody out there to seek some opportunities to get out uh, of just doing planning and get engaged in the follow-on uh, uh, activities from planning. Well, uh, when I was at Illinois DOT, uh, Illinois, uh, and this is general for all um, public sector, uh, you don't do a whole lot of uh, debt. There's a lot of work, a high volume of work in the public sector, and, uh, uh, and you're exposed to a lot of different things and needing to make decisions. But as I said earlier, a lot of times the private sector needs to be brought in as consultants to do the detailed work of providing facts to the public sector um, because the private sector folks have enough time to really focus and, and, and do detailed work. So I was at Illinois DOT for six years and I felt as though I, I needed to go to the private sector so that I could sharpen my technical skills. And I went to Michael Baker for a while and worked on a big interstate uh, construction uh, planning project uh, development, NEPA, and uh, design. What I wish I'd known about that is that uh, when you go to the private sector and work on a large project specific where they hired a bunch of people to work on the project, that when that big project is over, if they don't have another one, they don't really have anything to do uh, for you to do. Uh, and uh, so that's what happened uh, with me at Michael Baker. I wasn't laid off. I saw it coming and sought opportunities to move out east. My first uh, supervisory position was with the Virginia DOT where I, I had the opportunity to interview people uh, and hire them. Uh, what I'd wish I'd known about working uh, in Virginia at a certain level uh, is that uh, when a new administration comes in, and this happened in Virginia, there was a change of governors, um, that can really change the tone and the culture as well as the, the compensation package in a, in a public agency significantly. And it became difficult to work there, not because of the environment. I, I love the folks at Virginia DOT, but because the 
compensation that I was getting changed significantly and I couldn't make ends meet. So I, I went back to the um, private sector and worked at Wilbur Smith for a while um, doing essentially the same thing I was doing at Virginia DOT, um, but uh, providing advice again to the, to the folks that I used to work for uh, as opposed to actually making the decisions myself. Um, on September 11th, 2001, I happened to be in Washington, D.C. I mentioned earlier I was in the ROTC and I still was in the reserves and I happened to be doing a, a, a reserve tour here uh, in D.C. and um, that led to me being on continuous active duty here in Washington uh, at the National Defense University until 2015. One of the things I did when I was at uh, NDU is I served as a liaison from the Army to the city of Washington. When my three years was up, the, the city recruited me heavily to, to come and work in their Department of Transportation uh, to help out with uh, an agency restructuring, an organizational restructuring. And, and there uh, I had a, a team of planners and engineers and constructors similar to what I have now at, at AECOM. Now I've already addressed a number of these issues. Um, considerations for those of you who may be working in college on um, going to your first job. Again, I would, I would recommend that you seek an opportunity at an entry level that uh, allows you exposure to the full uh, spectrum of, uh, of planning through delivery so that you get a good solid background in, uh, in what happens with your planning products once they, once they go down the road to, to designers and constructors. Um, at various different levels, I address this too, and, and things can be different, but I, I kind of want to go back to the point that I made below about uh, public sector making decisions and private sector supporting it. Um, public sector jobs tend to be very broad in scope and dealing with a, a lot of actions. And so you have to be very horizontal and, and agile uh, when you're in the public sector. You also have to be decisive and be able to make those decisions, deal with politicians, and, and come to a consensus and be the one that leads that. And the private sector, relative to the public sector, the jobs tend to be relatively narrow in scope, um, but you're dealing subject matter depth. Um, technical expertise and, and really um, shining light on facts that the decision makers in the public sector need in order to make um, good decisions. Um, I have known and observed folks moving from one side to the other to struggle with the, with the difference in those roles. Private sector employees who are respectful of the fact that they know that they're essentially providing advice, switching over to the public sector and being seen as indecisive, um, and vice versa, public sector folks who are accustomed to calling the shots, switching over to the private sector and um, struggling with, with their new role that is supportive and not, and not decision making anymore. Again, I, I want to stress this point that it's very important to know what's within your control. The relationships that you have with your peers, with mentors, with the folks that you supervise, um, the body of work that you have, regardless of where you work, uh, and your volunteer activities. And I can't stress enough that volunteerism is, is the third leg of this, um, of this stool. It's very, very important to have volunteer uh, activities within your profession and within your community. You know, all things being equal, if you're staying within the profession and you maintain these three things, your relationships, your work, and your volunteerism, it's, not, it's really not that much of a switch. As others have said, the work-life balance is roughly the same. Compensation is, is roughly the same, you know, when you add it all up, depending on the, the money and the benefits and the time. 
I, I would say that that uh, the compensation does become starkly different as you move uh, into more executive positions. The the private sector can offer significantly more than the public sector can, um, but prior to the, to having 25 or 30 years in the profession, the compensation is really roughly the same. And frankly, job security is about the same, especially these days um, with, with governments struggling to have the money that they need to do what they need to do. Um, I have worked and lived through drawdowns, reductions in force um, on both sides when I worked for both the Virginia DOT and the District of Columbia Department of Transportation, we had reductions of force. Uh, and uh, we have had in several of the private companies I work for as well. It really has to do with this bottom point on my slide here. Uh, what is the backlog of the, uh, of the company that you're interviewing with or the funding stream for the private sector employee that you're working for? And I would encourage uh, those of you who are interviewing with uh, prospective employers to research it. For the most part, uh, you might be able to find this information online, but definitely ask questions about it so that you know how uh, stable the organization is. Uh, be sure to ask when you're interviewing uh, what the organization, as well as your, the person you're interviewing with, how they feel about their support for volunteer activities and the extent to which they will um, allow you to uh, and, and enable and support you in your volunteerism. I personally think that it's important uh, uh, to know what the mission and the essential functions that support the mission of an organization are, uh, as well as the values of that organization, uh, and make sure that, that yours are aligned with those of the organization and, uh, and the people that you're interviewing with. So I think, uh, I hope I've caught us up. So we've got about 400 people out there. So now uh, uh, we're going to turn it over to the audience for questions. Our contact right. information is shown here. Thank you. Um, again, um, for folks who want to ask questions, you can type them in that questions chat box in your GoToWebinar toolbar. And um, just to let everyone know, um, your questions are anonymous. Um, I, I see your name, but I'm not going to tell anybody. <laughs> I'm the only one that sees who you are uh, asking the question. Our speakers and our audience don't know who you are. So if you have a question, uh, feel free to type them in. And let's get started. Um, the first one is really just a comment. Back in the beginning when we were discussing um, liability insurance, uh, the, the comment is for any of our Canadian friends listening, uh, you should be aware that liability insurance is included as part of your professional CIP fees. So that's that. And there were a couple questions also um, about liability insurance and the yearly cost of liability insurance. So if, if anyone um, could speak to that, I think, I forget who mentioned it first. Was it Jennifer who might have mentioned it first? If someone would like to, to speak on that. Um, yes, I did mention it. In my presentation, this is Jennifer. Um, the way your professional liability insurance is, the cost is based upon what your estimated billing is. Um, and, and there's different levels you can have. I think I've got $1 million, $5 million for my amount. And um, and I think the first year ended up being about $2,500. And then it's, it's, it jumps up a little bit more each year because obviously they cover more projects um, because there's you know more liability because you've done more work um, it's really hard to find professional liability insurance and it would be nice if APA could you know coordinate it and find a couple of resources because what I found is that insurers really don't know how to look at planners I mean they clearly understand how to insure a architect who has liability if the building collapses or an engineer um, but not really a planner because we don't ever build anything so there's not that type of risk um, but you know so it took a while and I ended up deciding at the end that I wanted to get real estate and um, architecture one which is probably more than I needed to but I wanted to be safe um, but that's something I think an area that APA could really help in helping 
to define the policy and some different companies that will provide it as well. Does that answer your question? Yeah, great. Um, and we'll keep you on for a second to start this next question then if anyone else wants to chime in. The next one is um, advice for reentering the workforce following a break as a stay-at-home parent. And I guess this could, so we'll start I guess with Jennifer, but I think that we could probably expand this to say if you just took a break period from the planning field and are re-entering it now. So let's start with Jennifer and if anyone else has any comments to chime in after her. I agree with what you're saying because obviously there's the mom re-entering but you know now dads are taking time off too but I think there's also the issue of if you were laid off a couple of years ago or your project was a contract related to um, a specific project, there's people who've been laid off and those people are obviously going to have a gap of employment. Um, the first thing you see is like in my resume, I make sure that I say that I was a mom because if employers see that you have a gap, it really raises a lot of flags. Frags. So don't be afraid of saying why you really took it off. And you know, maybe it's caring for your mother or you know, in my case it was to be to to um, to watch my kids and stay home while they're young. Um, for me, I, I struggled with going back, and the primary reason I went back to work was because my husband wanted to start a business, and I needed life. I needed insurance because I have one kid in particular who's got a lot of medical needs. So I reluctantly went back into the workforce. And the irony was, is I was making less money. I was actually coming out in the negative because I had to go and pay for childcare. I had to pay for everything else. Um, so at the end of the day, it was actually costing me money to go back to work, but because I needed the health insurance, I did it. Um, my recommendation is, is if you're going to be taking a time period off, is make sure you keep those connections. Make sure you stay involved with the APA. You keep that membership active. Um, remain active. Make sure you still know all the players so that when you do return, you can jump right back in. Um, I was fortunate enough that while I was out for several years, I had people who kept bugging me to come back to work, and it never was quite the right opportunity. And for me to go work for a law firm worked really well because I wasn't going to be doing night hearings. I could get the attorneys to do my public hearings for me. So for me, that was a better match for me to go work for a law firm and have them take care of the hearings than it was for me to go back to a city. Hi, this is Ralph. Um, I would just add uh, to what Jennifer said uh, about keeping uh, networked and uh, you know attend conferences when you can. Um, and certainly, if you're AICP, you probably wouldn't want the AICP membership to to lapse because you wouldn't want to have to go through the exam process again. But uh, that's a good opportunity to really target um, your professional development, at least in terms of your certification maintenance, and pick and choose the kinds of uh, sessions and webinars and whatnot that uh, that really interest you or would further your career. Uh, uh, track depending upon where you think you might want to end up once you return from your leave. Um, I think at this point there are just so many opportunities like this one which are uh, free of charge and uh, um, can get you the uh, the CM credit. So um, you know there should be plenty to choose from if that's the direction you want to go in. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> next question. This is this is for anyone. Um, what skills or experience are are more important when making the switch? I assume from public sector to private sector. Is it more about project management or staff management or both? Um, does anyone initially want to chime in on that? Uh, this is Ralph. Um... I would, I mean, it depends upon what level you're you're getting uh, into, but uh, I would say that project management is probably more important than staff management, unless you know that you're really moving in the direction of a supervisory uh, role. So, you know, especially if you're uh, a younger uh, planner, that probably wouldn't be the case. But project management, that I found to be uh, very important, and that's something that. Um, I think are, is looked for both on the public and private sector. Um, there were several references in, in, during the presentations about workload and managing workload. Um, and in my experience, I was always 
involved with multiple projects at a time, and you have to be able to um, meet your various deadlines. Um, one of the challenges in the private sector, frankly, is that uh, your clients are very different. If you work in the public sector, especially if you work for a particular city or town, as opposed to an agency like a regional planning agency like mine, you're working with the same people all the time. But when, once you jump into the private sector, you have to try and remember and juggle who it is that you're meeting with on a given day, who the players are, what the politics are, uh, things along those lines. And you're also going to be managing and juggling multiple deadlines, um, uh, multiple delivery deliverables, and uh, you'll be looking to you know, they're not all going to be the same. It's not going to be cookie cutter stuff. It's you're going to have to prepare different types of deliverables for different types of clients. So, um, in my opinion, I think the project management is is more important. Unless you really know that you're moving into a supervisory role, where uh, managing a, a staff is going to be more critical. Uh, I'd like to add from a private sector perspective that I agree with, with Ralph um, and projects in the private sector are all budgeted by or m many are budgeted by the hour and so uh, it's important to be able to to manage time and to juggle multiple projects in an efficient way so that you stay as to the greatest extent possible within uh, the budget numbers of hours that are allocated. So I think that it's an essential, very important skill to have and to bring to uh, any job. This is Todd. And uh, just one of the things that was mentioned a minute ago about um, you know, having multiple clients and, and the, the managing those progress, and as Jennifer said, the hours, but also those people skills that were alluded to. You really need to know how to, to approach each of the different clients. and and what their quirks are and who are the power players. So that gets to be very um, important when you're managing all those different projects. OK, thanks. Next question. This, is, this one's kind of interesting. Um, can, can you spend too much time on one side uh, where it might just make it too hard to switch to the other side? Um, I guess I'll jump in because uh, I spent my entire career up until last year in, in the private sector. So um, I would say that it, it's not a big issue. Um, uh, like I said, one of the things that I had to get used to was that there were a lot of things that I took for granted working in the private sector that I could just go and do. You know, I could just sign up for a seminar like this or, uh, you know, some breakfast meeting and, uh, you know, just write the $10 registration fee on my uh, expense report and, and not worry about it. No one would question it. It's just part of the stuff that I was expected to do. And, you know, in the public sector, at least in my agency now, I have to, you know, at least think twice about it before I just uh, go ahead and, and do it. But, um, you know, I I think that's, that would be the case regardless of whether you're jumping from one sector to another or just jumping from one job to another. It's just getting used to the culture. So um, you know, from my perspective, uh, I spent more than 30 years in the private sector and just about one in the public sector. So uh, I don't, yeah, the, the workload is pretty similar. The project management requirements are pretty similar. The budgeting and all of that stuff is pretty similar. So um, you know, I didn't find that it was that I had burned too much time in the private sector before jumping over to the public. I'd like to add on to that. Some of the best planners I know are planners that have been on both sides. Because I think that makes you a very valuable planner if you can understand that there's always two sides to every case. Um, there's different pressures, there's different expectations, and uh, there's different objectives for every case. So the planners that I've seen that have been on both sides are much better. I'm always annoyed when I see planners that have spent all, their entire career either on the private side or planners that have been, spent their entire career 
on the city side and they become so focused on that perspective that they can't look and understand a project or an issue from another perspective. Okay, thank you. Um, next question. Let's see what we have here. All right. Um, aside from like a writing course promotion, uh, what are some other marketable skills that a planner can present to make themselves more marketable to a firm? Um, I would say the connections. If, if you're looking uh, by, by firm, if the meaning is going to the private sector. Uh, one thing that I definitely found helpful when I went from the small firm to the large firm was that I came into it with lots of connections, not only just in my particular region, but nationally, and that I could parlay those connections into uh, real work. So um, just knowing the, uh, um, the lay of the land from a planning perspective, knowing who the players are, who the actors are, um, having good connections, having developed a good project uh, a workload that uh, with good recommendations, those were all things that I could uh, talk about when I interviewed for uh, for the job with the engineering firm VHP. And uh, one of the things they were asked that they asked me to do between my first and second interview was to put together a business plan. And because I knew what the planning market looked like, because I had connections, because I had done uh, marketing and business development work before and felt comfortable with it, I was able to put together a business plan that they were able to buy into. So I think that those are uh, important things to uh, bring to uh, an interview if you're looking to move to the uh, private sector. It's, it's Mike. Um, folks that um, understand the question seems to be about moving from uh, uh, the private, the public sector to a firm. Um, folks that have always worked for a firm, um, they really don't, they really don't understand how the government works. Um, it, and it can be mind-boggling, I think, sometimes for folks when they do. Uh, I had an employee of mine recently who had been with uh, AECOM for 20 years. He had been a project manager. Um, and he left recently and went to a government agency. And I, I stopped in to visit him. And uh, he pulled his organization chart out and their, 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 their project management business process flow chart. And he, he put them up for me and he said, Mike, here I sit in this box right here, um, and I oversee consultants that, that are supporting this portion of it. When I was a consultant for 20 years, he said, um, I thought this was all there was to it, because um, it was all that, that he had ever done. He had no idea how much goes into developing um, a public action um, to the point where, where a consultant is ready to be brought in to assist it. Uh, and and it had really opened up his and broadened his mind about about government. And I think that those of you who are in government and can understand that and translate it and and bring an understanding of how government works to a firm, um, that the firm would find that to be invaluable. Uh, in it, this is Dina. In addition, I think that you need to um, be able to bring specifics of that related planning experience. Does it match the kind of experience that this job is going to um, need skills for? And I think that it's it's not enough to say well, I was involved in this project. It's, it's really important to talk exactly about the kinds of things, the role that you played, um, the kinds of decisions that were made, the implementation, what, 
specifically what it is that you did on um, a family of projects that might in fact be applicable to and transferable to the skills that you would need to do in the firm. Um, if I might add to that, the another way that you can kind of show your experience if you don't have a whole lot of projects or anything that you can point to that are tangible is LinkedIn has a feature where you can ask for recommendations. And one of the first things I did was go when I went out on my own is I sent a blast out to some of the people I worked with over the last couple of years. I think I sent it out to like 40 people and said, hey, can you recommend me? And people were really good and I got some great response back. I think I got like 30 people that responded back. And it was everything from consultants to directors. And actually, I ended up taking those recommendations and ended up putting them on my firm resume. And I've gotten more compliments about that from people who said, wow, you know, so-and-so, or you've done this, or people say this about you. So that's an easy way to go and boost your resume up and without, without especially when you're project poor and you can't really point to anything that's, you know, that's extraordinary. Okay, thank you. Um, this, this next question is for anyone, and if we could all look into our, our crystal balls for the future, uh, the question is, um, where where do you see this profession going with baby boomers retiring, and what what opportunities might come about? And um, there, quite a few people have asked this question. The economy being what it is. You know, there are some communities where they only have one or two planning staff persons, so they have to ship out all of their planning work to consultants. And then on the other side, um, they might be told, well, no, we're doing everything in-house now, so no, we're not going to be utilizing consultants. Um, so I, I can imagine that a lot of people are thinking, should I, should I stay or should I go? And, and where, where are we headed in, in the next several years? Uh, so if, if anyone could whip out their crystal balls and speak to that. Todd, I, I think there's still going to be that need, whether it's internal to an organization or, or through uh, consultant work. You know, as, with, you know, as you said, with budgets being uh, tighter, before people and, and organizations make that investment, they want to make sure they're making as good a decision as they can, and to do that, they need to study that, and that's where our profession comes in and helping make those um, value-oriented decisions. So I think that going forward, you're going to see even more um, need for looking at, at issues from all sides and and having planners be kind of that um, referee, neutral party, so to speak, on looking at those issues and and uh, helping make the decision or guiding that decision with the policymakers. And I think also um, just the uh, ever-growing range of what falls into the planning realm uh, is going to further uh, um, explain the need for uh, planners to get involved, whether it's public or, or private sector. When we look at the demographic changes and the aging of our population, how are we going to provide transportation for the uh, senior citizens? How are we going to provide public health and social services? Um, how are we going to house them? What are, uh, and then beyond that, just the links between public health and land use and uh, um, you know, planning for public health and looking at uh, food access and uh, trying to meet the needs of um, the lower income uh, populations. I think all of those things, these demographics are changing on a rapid uh, basis and uh, it's important for planners to keep up with those, those trends and those demographic changes and be able to respond to them regardless of whether you're in the uh, public or private sector. So I think that just trying to uh, manage how our profession is evolving in terms of meeting the needs of our uh, 
uh, local, county, and state governments is, is going to be another important aspect of it. Okay, thank you. Next question. This is a good one. When moving from the public sector to the private sector, do you find or, or come upon more ethical challenges? For example, uh, now in the private sector, the client tells you what they want, say, in a rezoning re request, which uh, might be contrary to what you believe is appropriate as a professional planner. So it comes down to, do you, do you pass on money, or do you and, and go with your ethical belief, or do you take it and say, well, this is my client now, so I, you know, I need to do what they tell me? Uh, this is Jennifer. Um, I took a case last year that I was completely opposed to, but I took it because someone had asked me to do it and said, I need you to do this case, you can do a good job on it. It was for a medical marijuana case. And I struggled with, should I take this case? I mean, it wasn't exactly the best paying, but it was, it was a, a very well-respected person. They wanted me to take the project. They wanted me to do it the right way. Uh, because frankly, in that area, in zoning entitlements and marijuana, there's just, there's, there's, you know, there's, there's not a lot of really good people who are doing it. So I struggled with the ethics of that. I mean, but the reality is, it's legal and stuff like that. And I had, and it was a good experience because I had to learn to put my personal beliefs on an issue aside, and then to ethically and legally represent that client to make sure their project gets approved and that it's approved the correct way. So sometimes we got to, as planners, go to pull ourselves away from our core set of beliefs and say, how can we represent our client the best way, the legal way, the ethical way? And sometimes there's going to be a difference. But sometimes that'll, by doing that, it'll make you actually grow professionally. You can make, make bigger steps. Um, and it ended up being a really great case. And frankly, I learned a lot about it. And after talking to the people in the medical marijuana area, understanding it, understanding their passion. My perspective ended up changing that there are a bunch of potheads who want to get high to these are people who really believe in it and there's some really great reasons as to why we should approve marijuana. So I would encourage everybody to, to think outside the box, not get in a corner with your beliefs, and to listen to other people and sometimes take those cases that kind of challenge your own personal belief system that, again, you know, represent them ethically. I agree with what Jennifer just said. I, I think, of course, um, just so we're all clear about the question, it, it's important to draw a line if uh, if clients asking you to do something that is clearly unethical or in violation of the ethics code or illegal. Um, you know, you, you don't do that. Um, however, if it's simply um, a matter of getting engaged in supporting an opposing argument, that's perfectly valid. There's nothing unethical about it. Um, it's just not something that you agree with. I think uh, Jennifer's exactly right and spot on, and I've experienced this my own self, that uh, stepping into the other person's shoes, seeing it from their perspective, um, is helpful, even if it didn't necessarily change my point of view. Um, in, in terms of being in favor or not in favor, I, I certainly was able to appreciate the other side and uh, and continue to um, articulate my perspective even even better. So um, Jennifer's exactly right. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see. Next question, um, what are your experiences, uh, this is for anyone, in charging flat fees versus billable hourly? 
Um, and I guess this sort of brings up a, a larger question of uh, a lot of folks who might be moving from the public sector to the private sector, and if they're not going into a firm, but they're going off on their own, um, are they just going to be pulling hourly rates out of the sky? Um, and how do they go about billing and, and budgeting for these types of projects? Does anyone have uh, any advice on how to go about this? If, if you're running solo, uh, moving from the public sector to the private sector for the first time? Um, I bill by the hour. So go ahead. Wait, I'll wait. I bill by the hour. I find it a much easier and a much fairer way for the client. Um, if you bill by the project, I think there's times you can do that if you have a planning related project, but in a zoning related project, I think it's very difficult to bill on a project level because you just, at the beginning of the project, you just don't know necessarily the direction that the project's going to go in. Um, and so there's a real risk if you bill by the project on a project and it changes the scope as you go along, you're either going to have to do a lot of change orders or you're going to lose your pants on it because you've already agreed to a certain price. So personally, I always just bill by the hour. Yeah, I was just going to say that, that sort of similar. Uh, it's typically easier to use time and materials um, on, the, on the billing. Uh, the lump sum contract, um, clients sometimes like it because they know exactly what um, their, their charge is going to be. But as Jennifer alluded to, you can uh, get yourself in a hole pretty easily unless you can do change orders. And some clients get very reluctant to do change orders. Um, so I think the hourly approach or time materials approach uh, works pretty well. And, and just researching that, you can you do some looking around, uh, talking with other other folks on what they think you know a reasonable charges are, and then you just got to figure out if that works for you or what what changes you might need to make for that. Uh, in addition, at the risk of sounding like I'm pushing the private practice division, I really think that a resource like that at APA is one that. Uh, you should take advantage of. There are a lot of sole practitioners and uh, uh, private practice members with very small offices, practices, um, that could be contacted. Um, and I'm sure they would be happy to sh share experiences and share um, their practice, what they do and how they charge. Okay, great. Um, I think we're going to go ahead and close up now. For those folks who did not get your, your questions answered, um, feel free to contact uh, the speakers uh, with their contact information is, is on the slide. Um, so I, I want to thank the Private Practice Division and our speakers today, uh, Dina, Jennifer, Mike, Todd, and Ralph for joining us. Um, and everyone have a great weekend, and we will talk to you all at our next webcast. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.